I am delighted to introduce to you the Reverend Dr. Paul Baxley. Paul is a native of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, is, has family that still lives there. But right now he makes his home in Athens, Georgia, because our national denomination is headquartered nearby in Atlanta. Paul was, uh, you're going to have to remember me when you were elected our executive. 2019, 2019 January. 2019, right before the bottom fell out. It was a great time. Yeah. So um, in 2019, uh, Paul was elected our executive coordinator of our national denomination, the Corporate Baptist Fellowship. Previously, he was a pastor of First Baptist Church there in Athens, Georgia. He succeeded uh, Susie Painter who uh, right before she left CBF preached in our pulpit, I believe, uh, right before I came to, uh, to River Road Church. And so we are delighted again to welcome our executive coordinator back to River Road Church and to, uh, to worship here among us. What we're going to do this morning, uh, Paul is going to give us a little bit of CDF 101, share some of the current initiatives and exciting things going on on the national denominational stage. Um, and then I would love for uh, you to ask some questions or grill him about something he's written or whatever you want to do uh, during that time. And friends, let's open with a word of prayer. Holy and loving God, we are grateful for this day. We are thankful for the life and witness and ministry of Paul Baxley and what he means to our fellowship, what he means to you, to our missionaries around the globe and to our churches around the globe. We thank you that he has given up his time to come to Richmond and visit with us, fellowship with us, and share with us some of the good work that we are able to do together. Open our minds and open our hearts as we receive the good news he shares this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it is absolutely wonderful to be here at River Road today. Being here is an important pilgrimage for me for several reasons. Uh, one is that River Road Church has been a leader congregation in the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship from the very beginning. Um, Jim Slatton <laughs> chaired the committee, as I recall, that hired Cecil Sherman to be the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship's first executive coordinator. Members of this church have been leaders in our fellowship's cause in Virginia and around the world. Uh, this church was an integral catalyst for a entity that several of us in the room knew deeply and loved tremendously, namely the Baptist Theological Seminary at Richmond, which even though it has taught its last classes, I would suggest has never had a greater influence on the life of cooperative Baptist congregations than it does just now, because individuals who graduated from that school 10, 15 years ago are now pastoring congregations like River Road. So there is still a witness and still an influence. And I would say, Dr. Graves, it has never been higher than it is right now. This church was deeply wed to the ministry and witness of that school, is involved in new endeavors in theological education, and your current staff has occupied significant leadership in our fellowship. Daniel served on the discovery team for our Toward Bowl faithfulness process. Marnie is on our governing board, which means although I work for all of you to some degree, I work especially for her. And she's also in leadership of Cooperative Baptist Fellowship in Virginia. So time really does not allow me to name all the ways that your church has provided really substantial leadership to our fellowship through its more than 30 years of existence. And so I want to honor that. I want to express gratitude for that. And I think it's important that I come by it from time to time and give you a report on what we are doing with the vision and energy and prayers and resources that you are investing in a Baptist witness beyond the witness of your own congregation. So that's what I want to do today. 
But I also want to acknowledge this is a personal pilgrimage for me, because for a couple of years, between 2002 and 2004, I was a member of this church. Uh, while I served on staff at Baptist Theological Seminary at Richmond, I was in worship uh, a little less than half the time because I was traveling around Virginia and all over the place representing the school. But when I was here, the worship life, the preaching, the music, the community was a tremendous gift of grace. So it is really good to be home uh, on this Sunday. So here's what I'm going to do. This is Sunday school, so I want to talk a little bit about the Bible. I want to talk to you a little bit about where we are in the life of CBF. And then I'm going to stop and give you a chance to ask any question you want to ask. And I will warn you, if you don't ask any questions, I am a Baptist pastor and I can keep talking. So keep that in mind so you can use the next, oh, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes to either listen to what I'm saying or focus on the question you want to ask or both. Uh, and I'll welcome your questions and your responses. Cooperative Baptist Fellowship made an intentional decision in our very beginnings to call ourselves a fellowship. Surprise, surprise, I'm told, although I'd like to point out I was studying for exams at Wake Forest when all these debates were taking place, that there was a rigorous debate about whether or not this new entity would call ourselves a convention or a union or an association. And a lay person from North Carolina actually led the charge that we would call ourselves a fellowship. And for much of our 30 years of history, there's been a great argument among some about whether or not fellowship is a strong enough word to describe the life we are called to share together. Might we be better off with the stronger word? Well, this is where the Bible comes in. Uh, I want to share with you a passage of scripture from 1 John. The very opening verses. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you that we have what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. <laughs> I read this scripture from 1 John to elevate our understanding of fellowship. Because you see, when we Baptists think fellowship, we have kind of fallen into a bad habit about thinking about the things that we do before the really important stuff starts. It's the room, it's what we call the room where we eat the meals before the main event happens. It's, um, it's the chicken and the vegetables and the potatoes and the bread. It's the, it's the fun stuff around the serious stuff. And so that makes us at risk to ask ourselves, is that really a strong enough word to describe the life of a Baptist community that was called into existence by the initiative of God? And when people start asking that kind of question, operating from a lower definition of fellowship, I like to remind people that fellowship, for the scholars in the room, the, the Greek word is koinonia. I know there are some scholars here, so I point that out. It refers to the inner life of the triune God. Now, thank the triune God, I've not been invited here this morning to explain the theology of the Trinity. You can find better uh, candidates than me for that cause. But whatever you make of it, however you frame it, however you define it, any word that describes the inner life of the triune God, a life characterized by mutual love and sacrificial love and relentless pursuit of God's mission of love in the world is not a low category. Any word that can characterize the inner life of God that explodes in the world, that invites us into fellowship with God, cannot be characterized as an inadequate description of that. I want to suggest to you this morning that the world needs fellowship a lot more than it needs conventions. 
that the world needs fellowship a lot more than it needs associations. That the ties that would bind us together in fellowship with the triune God and God's Son, Jesus Christ, that has to be a stronger tie than any we could imagine on our own. In fact, it reminds me, uh, and then I'll move on a little bit, of one of the craziest definitions I ever heard of Baptist congregation. Was anybody in the room other than me ever told that a Baptist congregation is a gathering of like-minded believers, or was that a North Carolina virus? You don't need a God who raises dead people to hold together like-minded people. Facebook can engineer that. Usually destructively. But you need a God whose love overflows in the world in the resurrection of Jesus Christ to hold broken, hurting, struggling, searching, striving people together in a quality of life that we could not have on our own. And that's what fellowship is. So one of the, the convictions I developed traveling around this job is that one of the first things I have to do is to remind people that to be a fellowship is not a lesser category. It is a life together in the life of God. It is a different category altogether. So that I think begs a, a more practical question, who's in this particular fellowship? Well, it's you and about 1,399 other congregations predominantly in the southeastern United States. So the greatest concentration of CBF churches today is actually in Virginia, North Carolina, upstate South Carolina, North Georgia, toward Birmingham, Alabama. We still have missionary activity in Texas, you'll be glad to know. I feel obliged to point that out because I'm the first person in this job who's not from Texas which meant when I started, I had to go out there and prove to them that I knew Jesus. Um, but we, you are in fellowship with about 1,400 other congregations, primarily in that geographic area, but not exclusively. And I'll give you personal testimony. In the last several years, I've been in CBF congregations as far to the Northeast as New London, Connecticut. Before next year is out, I will be in CBF congregations in Arizona and California. We have CBF partner congregations in Puerto Rico. CBF has a new covenant with about 114 congregations in Puerto Rico. Uh, although uh, most CBF congregations are predominantly white, CBF is starting to experience growth among African-American and Latino congregations in the United States and outside. Uh, so we are not a stagnant fellowship. Any fellowship that comes out of the life of God has to be a living, breathing, growing, dynamic fellowship. Otherwise, it's stale. Um, our fellowship includes 50 career uh, missions field personnel who serve in the United States and 19 other countries around the world. Talk more about that in a minute. Our fellowship currently includes 12 partnerships with theological schools with whom we partner to prepare new generations of women and men who are called to the ministry or to the life of the mission field. Our fellowship includes more than 1,000 endorsed chaplains and pastoral counselors. This year actually marks the 25th anniversary of the first time the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship endorsed chaplains and pastoral counselors. We'll have a celebration of that at our General Assembly next June in Atlanta. So our fellowship also includes other kinds of partner organizations, media partners like Baptist News Global. I hear they had a meeting this week in Richmond. Uh, we have partners like the Center for Healthy Churches that serve congregations in times of specific um, visioning or conflict or leadership transition. Our fellowship includes a foundation and a benefits board that help congregations with different kinds of particular financial needs. So our fellowship includes congregations and individuals. It is national as well as global. So that's a little bit of a specificity going next to the Sunday morning Bible study I skated through quickly. 
want to hold up several things for you this morning just by way of update information where are our energies right now we believe that we have been invited into fellowship with god and one another in order to encourage the thriving of congregations and their leaders i referred to a little while ago to the fact that uh, Daniel served on the discovery team of what we called our Toward Bold Faithfulness process. That was the vision process our fellowship undertook to clarify our calling as we began our fourth decade of ministry and mission. And one of the things that came from that process was that congregations across our fellowship, regardless of their size, their geography, their location, were experiencing certain kinds of urgent needs. And part of the calling of our fellowship was to organize our life together so that we could help congregations with those urgent needs. Now that doesn't mean 30 people who work outside Atlanta can meet all the needs in the fellowship. <laughs> the good news is the fellowship is more than an office in Atlanta or more than CBF Virginia based out of Richmond. It is that whole community of partners and congregations that if organized rightly and unleashed properly can serve one another to strengthen our congregations and call new generations of leaders. So I want to hold up several initiatives that we've started since that process. It's always good to remind Baptists that if, if you take them through a long process and ask them to fill out surveys and attend listening sessions, that something will actually come from it. And it's not just a, an exercise to keep a few people on the payroll for a little while. Um, one of the urgent needs that we discovered all of our congregations were experiencing related to financial strength. A lot of our congregations have buildings <laughs> that were built either during World War I or in the years right after uh, World War II. And those buildings in a lot of places have substantial deferred maintenance costs, uh, the care of which is uh, occupy more and more and more of the congregation's budget. <laughs> the cost of providing health insurance to church staff is skyrocketing, just like everybody's health insurance cost is skyrocketing. Um, although religious organizations like congregations still receive the largest share of charitable giving in the United States, <laughs> our share is shrinking because more and more of us are supporting more and more good causes with resources entrusted to us. And at least the rumor is that younger people don't give as generously as people who are older. My hunch is that's not a new problem, but it's real. And so recognizing that congregations across our fellowship were facing that need of navigating a different kind of financial environment, CBF has redeployed our own efforts and some of our partnerships to try to assist congregations in figuring out how do, what are new ways we can uh, approach raising money? Are there ways we can use our facilities both as a gathering space, as a ministry asset, and as a source of revenue? Are there ways congregations can learn from one another in navigating a new financial environment? So we established a new staff position called Congregational Stewardship Officer, whose primary job is to organize our fellowship's efforts to help congregations navigate their financial environment. We have established a closer partnership with the Lake Institute, which is a Lilly Endowment funded entity out of Indianapolis that specializes in helping congregations cultivate generosity. At our General Assembly this year in Texas, we released a new resource called Sacred Spaces, Innovative Places, which tells the story of how six congregations are using their facility in innovative ways. And you know one of them well, because you were in it. Your preschool, which I understand has an anniversary this fall, was highlighted in that resource that was released to the entire fellowship. Our Cooperative Baptist Fellowship Foundation Part of its uh, mission is to help congregations with their asset management. If they have endowments, reserve accounts, they adopted a bold new fee structure, which essentially no longer requires congregations to pay them any fees at all. 
a congregation that invests their money through the CBF Foundation has to pay for investment management services out of Texas, but they don't have a duplicated management fee anymore just to support the CBF Foundation, which means now the CBF uh, Foundation is not only one of the best investment management services out there, it's also one of the most affordable so that the congregations that were using them immediately save between them $100,000. Those are all efforts that our fellowship has unleashed, and it's just the beginning to help congregations navigate changing financial environments, changing demands related to facilities. Another place I'll hold up that our fellowship is at work is in trying to imagine new ways of partnering with congregations and theological schools to um, tend to the calling and preparing of new generations of ministers. CBF Virginia is on the front lines of those efforts uh, because in the last several years, Cooperative Baptist in Virginia established two new theological education partnerships. Uh, a colleague of mine and I from CBF Global got to participate in the process and help structure it. But Cooperative Baptist in Virginia established a Baptist House of Studies at Union Presbyterian Seminary and launched a partnership with the Baptist Seminary of Kentucky uh, to provide theological education for people who cannot uh, relocate from where they're currently living and serving to take classes in Richmond, Virginia. Because we're recognizing, and, and by the way, just a little credit where it's due, that need was being recognized and explored by Baptist Theological Seminary at Richmond at the end of the last century. Dr. Graves, y'all are way ahead. Uh, Baptist Seminary at Richmond is with Lilly Money that was one of the first efforts in the nation to take theological education out of a seminary campus and connect it with people who were in congregations who could not come to a centralized campus. I think the phrase used back there back then was relocating theological education. We both gave some speeches about it, as I recollect. Well, now the partnership with Baptist Seminary of Kentucky is all about bringing the resources of a theological school to people where they are serving. So that now Cooperative Baptist Fellowship uh, congregations in and beyond Virginia through these two new partnerships have access to one of the best residential theological education opportunities anywhere at the Baptist House of Studies at Union Presbyterian. And they also have access to an approach to theological education that can be made available to people wherever they are if their stage in life or their economic situation does not allow them to relocate from wherever they are to Richmond, Virginia, as beautiful as Richmond, Virginia is. My sense is that in the days to come, uh, increases in technology, the, the capacity of congregations around technology will make it possible for more and more people to prepare for ministry, receive theological education while serving in a congregation. And that will have advantages both to cost and to excellence. I give those two examples, Baptist Seminary of Kentucky, Union Presbyterian, partly because they're close to home, but partly because they reflect a commitment we have to work closely with congregations, state organizations, and schools to make sure that we are providing the best, most sustainable, most excellent preparation for those who will serve our congregations in the decades to come. Congregations need leaders. Congregations need help navigating their financial environment. Congregations have expressed a clarion hunger for more and more and more resources that can be used in Bible study and other kinds of setting. And we're actively at work both in CBF to produce more resources like that that are affordable and excellent, but also to establish new partnerships that do the same. So those are three examples. You might want to ask about others and you can in a minute when I breathe of how CBF is reorganizing ourselves to serve needs of congregations that have emerged in our listening and our work in the last several years. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about global missions. Because when CBF was organized more than 30 years ago, part of the dream was that we would be in the business of participating in Jesus' mission all around the world. That we would be sending career missionary field personnel to serve in other places 
and that sending those field personnel to serve in other places would also help our congregations in the United States be more faithful in an increasingly global context. <laughs> you don't have to necessarily send someone halfway around the world to engage the global church when cities like Richmond and Atlanta and Louisville and Nashville are more and more global already. Um, we are in a season of important transition in CBF Global Missions right now. I've got all kinds of good news. Uh, as we meet today, the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship is not only supporting 50 full-time career missionary field personnel who serve in the United States and 19 other countries, we're in a candidate process right now to seek people who feel called to five open positions. At General Assembly last year, we announced that we were uh, open to searching for people to serve. One of those placements is in Houston, Texas. The other four are in other parts of the world. We'll know later this fall how many folks we will commission at General Assembly next June. But this is the first time in several years we've been in a strong enough position financially and otherwise to actively seek uh, to commission and begin new field personnel assignments. That's incredibly good news. Um, we are... Um, for the first time in years, our gifts to global missions are higher this year to the offering for global missions than they were in the previous year. Uh, gifts of congregations to field personnel programs and projects are the fastest growing part of our revenue stream, hands down. What makes our increased support for missions in CBF even more remarkable right now is that over the period February of 2022 until June, Fellowship Baptist gave $1.1 million through Ukrainian Relief Fund over and above their other support for global missions. And those funds are being used primarily by our field personnel in Central Europe who are on the front lines of response to uh, the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, we had field personnel who served for 20 years outside Kiev the Pagaiskis, uh, people who were in their ministries outside Kiev are now scattered to more than 11 countries around the world, but the greatest concentration is in Poland. The Pagaiskis spent several weeks in Poland uh, earlier this summer. Uh, there are a lot of Ukrainian refugees in Slovakia where we have another field personnel couple who's based out of Poprad. Um, so Cooperative Baptist, alongside the Global Baptist community are at the front lines of response to the war in Ukraine. Um, so our financial investment in global missions is increasing. And I think that is a remarkable sign of our commitment. Um, I also wanted you to know that our approach to global missions is increasingly unique. Uh, and this is always a hard point to make around Baptists who are at least as experienced as I am. Because when you get up and you say, as cooperative Baptists, we're supporting career missionary field personnel, you say, what kind of news is that? We've grown up Baptists. We've been supporting career missionaries our whole lives. But most denominations and most mission-sending organizations now are no longer in the business of career missionaries. Most denominations and most mission-sending boards are sending short-term placements. And they're requiring those people to raise all their own costs, which means you're essentially overseas fundraisers not career missionaries. Um, when CBF, say we commission four or five new field personnel units this year, you know what we'll do? We'll tell them to spend two years learning languages and building relationships and not rushing off and doing anything crazy. Because it turns out that if you're going to be a witness of the steadfast love of the Lord, you have to sort of do what Jesus did. I love the way Eugene Peterson translates uh, John 1, uh, 14. You know, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Peterson says, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. If you're going to bear witness of the steadfast love of the Lord, you got to move into the neighborhood. you got to build relationships. You've got to learn languages. You've got to make sure you're not just in the old colonialistic mission enterprise of spreading one particular national culture and dressing it up as Jesus. But instead, you've got to make sure that you are recognizing the ways Jesus is already at work in that place and joining in <laughs> and learning from and strengthening and advancing the ways the global church is already at work. 
So we encourage people to take their time and build relationships and start things in connection with other partners so that their mission lasts for the long term, even after they're gone. So some of CBF's most uh, beautiful ministries right now, there are no longer career field personnel. So touching Miami with love in Miami, Florida, I'll give you an example. We sent field personnel to Miami in 2004. They have run an incredible ministry down there, but they have now moved on. And that ministry in Miami is completely operated by and carried out by folks in Miami. <laughs> it's sustainable for the long term. Something exists now that will last even though CBF is not paying people to be in that community because of the relationships that were built, the influence of CBF congregations that came from all over to join in that ministry, the, the projects that were created, they now last even without us having personnel there. We try to approach our mission work in that way so that it's not about an individual, about, it's about God's mission and the community to which we're sent. So CBF Global Missions is growing, it is thriving, and I ask you to pray because we are currently seeking a new coordinator of Global Missions. And when I get back to Georgia this week, we are conducting, oh my goodness, nine virtual interviews with candidates for that position. And our prayer is that by the end of the year, our governing board will have a recommendation to act on to call the person who will be uh, CBF's fifth coordinator of Global Missions in our more than 30 year history. So our mission work is growing. We're finding new ways to serve congregations. And the last little bit of news I'll make, and I'll take your question is, uh, <laughs> we're financially sustainable. The, um, the spin on denominations is that we're, we're having financial trouble. Uh, through the last closed financial period, CBF's unrestricted revenue was at 96% of budget. CBS missions revenue was at 97% of budget. Income was ahead of expenses. That doesn't mean we don't need any more money. It means that we have found a sustainable foundation from which our life together can grow. It means we are being better and better stewards of the generous investment that congregations like yours are making. And we can be increasingly confident and increasingly hopeful about our future. What questions do you have? Yes, sir. Yes, I did. Yes. So for our friends on Zoom, the question was, could I clarify what I mean by the fact that CBF endorses chaplains and pastoral counselors? Um, CBF has endorsed chaplains serving in several different kinds of places. The greatest number of our chaplains are in healthcare. So hospital chaplains, hospice chaplains, uh, chaplains who are placed in uh, long-term care facilities. Um, we have a group of military chaplains who have been endorsed by CBF. That is the second largest um, cohort of CBF endorsed chaplains. Uh, there are university chaplains. So the chaplain at Marshall College in North Carolina is a CBF endorsed chaplain. The Baptist Campus Minister at Wake Forest University is a CBF endorsed chaplain. Um, there are also CBF endorsed pastoral counselors who are in um, pastoral counseling practices in various places. So what I'll clarify is CBF endorses chaplains and pastoral counselors. You have to have a denominational endorsement to be placed as a chaplain or pastoral counselor. Um, we provide continuing education for chaplains and pastoral counselors. We do not pay salaries for chaplains and pastoral counselors, except we've got about four global missions field personnel who are also endorsed chaplains because it's a part of their work. So that's what I mean. Yes, sir. What is the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship doing about bringing young people back into the church? Um, <laughs> so the good news of great joy is that Cooperative Baptist Fellowship still has plenty of room to grow 
in reaching younger people? A story I love to tell is I was at a meeting at Lilly Endowment right before the pandemic, and I was sitting across a table from the three people who these days control dispersals to religious causes for Lilly Endowment. And the first question they ask is, tell me, where do you cooperative Baptists get all the young people? And I wanted to say, well, you gave us a bunch of money and we used it well. Um, but that wasn't the entirety of the truth. Um, there are more young people in CBF heading toward the ministry and toward the mission field than in most denominations. Now, where the work still has to be done is working alongside congregations to help congregations discern how is it that we invite more and more young people into our life together. We're at a place right now where we're trying to identify congregations of different sizes and different types in our fellowship who are doing that really, really well so we can hold up their stories. So like this, this is actually an important point. I'm glad you asked this question because I forgot to say this and it's really important. We believe that every congregation and every individual in our fellowship has something to offer the rest of us. It's priesthood of all believers. We each have something we can teach. We each have a gift we can offer and we each bring a need. So just as we tried to identify congregations that had found innovative ways to use their facilities and tell their stories to the whole fellowship, we're looking right now for congregations that are doing ministry with youth, college students, young adults in ways that are really captivating so that then we can share those stories more widely. One of the early hunches that we are seeing is that congregations that are really engaging young people are really serious about transformation in their communities, not afraid of having honest and difficult conversations, and are willing to go meet younger people where they are and not just wait for younger people to show up in the building. I just gave you three theses of a 95 theses reformation. It's almost October. You'll have Reformation Sunday. I think Diana Butler Bass is coming. It'll be, a book, it'll be an even better day than today. But I mean, I, for us, the good news is the life of our fellowship is attracted to younger people. It's younger than it was <laughs> even five or 10 years ago. We are finding congregations that are having that same experience. So the next step is how do we elevate that expertise or that experience so that all of our congregations can learn from it and ask, okay, what does that mean here? In this cultural moment, I'm really suspicious of anybody who tells me they have a five-step program that'll work everywhere. If I was supporting a denomination and somebody came by and said, I can give you a, a five-step easy answer program, I might redirect my funds. because ministry these days is intensely contextual. And we're in a cultural moment um, in between the, the uh, public health pandemic and the partisanship pandemic and the institutional distrust pandemic. That means we are in really unusual territory and it's a good thing we serve a God who raises dead people. Is there a last question? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes. So, <laughs> so the question is, talk to, talk to us about African-American churches that are in or coming into CBF. Uh, there are both uh, church, new church starts that are predominantly black and there are established black congregations. Almost all of them are dually or multiply aligned. So some of them are aligned CBF National Baptist Convention. I'm going to bring greetings tomorrow night in Louisville at the opening session of the National Baptist Convention. Um, some of them are dually aligned CBF Progressive National Baptist. Some of them are CBF American Baptist outside the South. It turns out that multiple alignment is very Baptist just like dissent is very Baptist. Anybody who tells you you can't have multiple partners is probably not a Baptist. They might be dressed up as one and playing one on TV, but they might actually not be one. 
So um, those congregations are drawn to CBF, I would say for several different reasons. Um, one of them is that cooperative Baptist congregations, and we actually did some serious listening and learning over the last year about this, tend to be more genuinely committed than are a lot of other predominantly white spaces toward causes of genuine racial reconciliation and strengthening of the racial environment in this country. Um, I'll give you another illustration. We were in the process of considering someone for another position at CBF and one of the candidates for the position was black and was in a predominantly black denomination. And we talked to them about our vision of CBF existing for congregations, for the strengthening of congregations, to elevate the leadership of congregations and their leaders, younger as well as older. And he said to me, I don't think you realize how attractive that is and how unusual that is in most denominational spaces. So the fact that you can come to CBF and have a voice now, the fact that we will welcome leadership and learning alongside people from different cultures, uh, I think is also making us really, really attractive. Um, there is a new organization. So there's an organization across CBF called Pan-African Koinonia, which is to provide a gathering space for um, Black uh, Baptists who are in CBF individually and as congregations. <laughs> there's a state chapter right now being organized in South Carolina. So in, in mid-August, I spoke in a, a Black church outside Anderson, South Carolina, where um, the pastor was first drawn to CBF because he received a CBF scholarship for his theological education at Gardner-Webb Divinity School. Um, their associate pastor is currently in our CBF Fellows Program, which is our program for early career pastoral leaders. And that congregation is now predominantly CBF, but most of them are duly aligned CBF with another nomination. And we are seeing uh, growth in those congregations and growth in um, Spanish speaking congregations, mainly because we're open to learn together and make space for leadership and genuine relationship. It's challenging, but it's holy. And one of the things I learned years ago is that <laughs> just like somebody once told me Baptists were a group of like minded believers, they also gave me the impression that the Holy Spirit was in the business of making me feel good. But I give you this as a parting gift on the way to worship. You know what Jesus said about the coming of the Spirit in the Gospel of John? It will be the comforter, but it also will also convict and challenge. And CBF's calling to be a more global Baptist community, more racially diverse, more ethnically diverse, more generationally diverse, those are all places where we are growing and being challenged and being changed. And it's beautiful and terrifying all at once. So I give you, you know, a line from the Baptist preacher Chuck Poole, who in a sermon in North Carolina years and years ago, quoted the novelist Annie Dillard in her book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, where the true light shines, a special terror falls. If we're always entirely comfortable with what we think God is asking us to do, <laughs> we might should call Abraham and ask uh, Abraham about the sort of things that a God who raises dead people will sometimes do. Thank you so much for giving up your normal Sunday school space for this conversation. I hope you leave knowing a little bit about how we're thinking at CBF right now, a little bit more about what CBF's up to in the world. If you hear nothing else, you hear my gratitude for you and your congregation and your investment in our life together. We're gonna to go to worship where I am not going to do a denominational commercial. So, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Of course, we have Paul to be an administrative and missional executive at CBF, but nothing else, you're probably aware he is that part of Baptist preacher. <laughs> yep. And we 
we are, we are in for a treat uh, in worship today. One thing I want to say, and I hope I'm clear to our fellowship, Paul, that unlike some denominational relationships, you are a part of CBF not because this church is. You are a part of CBF because you are a part of CBF. Yes. My good friend, Courtney Allen, at, let me point the right way, at Grace Baptist Church in Windsor Farms, that is an American Baptist congregation, but she is as CBF as any of us here in this room yep. because she has chosen to affiliate there. Yes, we have almost 1,400 churches, but more important are the individuals that make up the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. You are invited to join in a Cooperative Baptist Fellowship gathering. You don't have to get your endorsement of your congregation you are because that's who you are, that's who you want to be. And, and I appreciate that CBF holds up affiliation on associational levels, congregational levels, but individual levels too. That's a very important part of who we are. And I'm grateful that you have made the investment in CBF and have allowed us together make this investment. So thank you for your time. Uh, we look forward to worship together. Go in peace until we see one another again. God bless you. Good to see you.